we are in a series today called How's Your Soul? This is week number three, and I'm so glad you're here. This is going to be great, but before we jump in, let me kind of catch you up on a couple things you need to know. Now, after the series is over, starting Sunday, September 10th, I'm really excited because we're starting a series that is all based on your decisions. The series is called Asking for a Friend, and all the topics we're going to talk about are things you told us you want to hear about on Easter Sunday. So we're going to talk about issues like stress and forgiveness and fear, like huge topics that we all struggle with. And so I'm asking you to not just come on that Sunday, but Sunday, September 10th, we're calling it One Big Sunday, and I'm asking you to do whatever it takes to bring someone who is not usually going to church, get them with you. Like twice a year, I want you sitting next to someone who doesn't go to church, and this would be the perfect opportunity. I mean, let's fill this place. Let's have people standing in the back because of what God does on that day. And here's the reason. I don't care about full auditoriums for my sake. I care about it because people matter to Jesus, and we really want to see a lot of people make the decision to follow him on that day. So it's going to be a huge day for us, so make plans to be here for that. Now, if you've missed any of the series, we're coming in on part three of a four-part series called How's Your Soul? And in this series, we're just asking this difficult question, how's your soul? Which means, how are you really? Like, how is the real you? The you that no one else maybe knows, but how, how is your soul. Now, we're all conditioned as Americans. When people say, how are you? We just say, good. I'm fine. Things are great. Like, we're just really quick on the draw with answers that may or may not actually be true. So for the next four weeks, we've been asking this question, like, how is your soul actually doing? Now, this idea comes from the Bible, the book of 3 John. John writes a letter to a guy, and here's what he says. 3 John 1, 2, he says, beloved, and I just love that word. We should bring that back. Beloved, which means you are loved. I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health. And you can pray that about me. I'll pray it for you. But it doesn't stop there because there's a comma, and it says, as it goes well with your soul, which means this. At the end of the day, you and I are only as healthy as our souls, as who we actually are. So week one, we started with this verse in the book of Genesis chapter two, where it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and at the end of his creation, he forms a man out of the dust, but then it was just a form. It was just a body. It had lips, hips, and fingertips. It was just a body, but, but it wasn't alive. It was just a body. It was just laying there. And verse seven of Genesis two says, and the Lord breathed his breath in through his nostrils, into his lungs, and the man came to life. And the word for breath, It's the same word that Hebrews would change to the word soul. It's your soul. You see, Adam was just a form. He was just a body until the soul from God, the breath of God, was given to him, which I love because it means this. It means you and I are the only creatures in all of God's creation that live on God's borrowed breath. So the question we asked on week one was how does our soul go from feeling nomadic, like it has no place to call home, to feeling at rest because it is at home? And we said this. Your soul feels at rest and your soul feels home when you take the borrowed breath that God has given you and you return it back to him. That's the reason when we sang just a moment ago, some of you felt these emotions that you couldn't even begin to explain. It's, it's not just mass karaoke. We're not singing a song to entertain you. We're actually taking the breath that God's given us, and through our words and through our worship and through our singing, we're returning it back to God. That is why your soul feels at rest. Well, then last week, I I said this. I said that our souls are comprised of many different parts. We have our will, which is the core of who we are. Then we have our mind, which is our thoughts and our feelings. Then on top of all that, we have our body and we have our relationships. And those are the things that compose our soul. And so I asked the question, what does it look like to maintain a soul that is not at war with itself, but is actually at peace? And so if you missed any of those, you can go online to our website and you can check those out. They'll always be there for you to watch. Today, I want to talk about how do we keep our soul healthy? How do you have a healthy soul for the rest of your life. And let's pray, then we'll jump in together, everybody. Let's pray. Father, in these next few minutes we have, I'm asking you to just kind of lay open our hearts so that we can hear from you. God, you know I've got these thoughts and these words prepared, but really none of this matters unless you show up and unless you speak to us. So God, with our hearts as open as we know how, with our ears as open as we know how, we just, we want to hear and receive from you now. We love you, God, and we thank you for that. And God, while I've got your attention, if you should want the Dallas Cowboys to win the Super Bowl this year, would you give us a sign Maybe, like, block out the sun tomorrow afternoon. That'd be cool. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's get to work, everybody. Let's get to work. I I really mean that. Um, In the first service, true story, in the first service, I said, would you block out the sun on Tuesday? That ain't going to happen. And uh, that's fun. Let's get to work. Um, If you were here last week, um, I had kind of a sad thing happen right at the beginning of the first song. I got a text from my dad that my sweet grandmother, who we affectionately call Meemaw, had died. Like, literally during the first line of the first song, my grandmother slipped into eternity. And it was this really sad moment for me, overcome with emotions, and 
this week, my brothers and I flew to Dallas, and we spent time there just kind of honoring her, and we had a beautiful celebration and memorial service. It was just absolutely beautiful. And then after the service was over, we got in our car, and as we walked out to the car, we're like, man, it stinks. Like, it smells really bad here. And I, I didn't know what that meant. Like, maybe it meant the bucks were in town or something. I don't know. But I just, I just it smelled really bad. And so then, then I was like, that's weird. So we get in the car, and we drive from the funeral service to the graveside, which was at this, it was at this beautiful, like, um, military funeral base. So we go there, a national cemetery, and we go there. It's like 40 minutes away, and the smell just, like, won't leave. Like, we try rolling the windows down. We're all, me and my brothers are, like, blaming each other at this point, you know, and it just will not stop. Then we get to the, the place of the, the cemetery, and it's just, it smells so bad. Everyone's complaining about it. And at this point, I'm like, I even at one point pulled my phone out, and I got on Twitter, and I typed in, like, Dallas smell, I, D- Dallas stink. Got all kinds of results I didn't expect. And then it was, but no one was talking about it, but everyone around us could smell it. And then anyways, when it was all said and done, we, after the funeral and this, the burial part, we went and we had a meal together as a family. And after the meal, the car wouldn't start. And I couldn't figure out what was up. We get it. Finally, we jump the car. We take it to the mechanic. And he's like, I know what your problem is. I, I could tell before I even got to the car, that smell, that smell you're smelling, that smell has been following you all day, it's because your battery is basically imploded inside. That, that is the smell. He knew what the issue was before he even got to it because of the smell. Now, what was funny to me was all of us were trying to figure out what is going on. Is there a paper mill? Is something happening? I, I didn't know what the smell was from. I just knew that there was a smell, and I was checking all the external circumstances, not realizing that the reason for the smell was actually the vehicle I was driving. It was, that was the problem. I wonder how many of us when life isn't going the way we want it to, when it feels like all of our circumstances aren't going the way we want, we look at all of the external factors and we try to figure out what's going on instead of looking the one place internally that matters more than anything, which is our soul. You see, you're only as healthy as your soul, but most of us, when things don't go the way we want, we work on external circumstances. We work on our behavior. We work on our appearance. We try to lose a few pounds. We, we get on antidepressants. Like, we do things that we try with all of our might to fix the problems that we're having, but those things that we try to fix on the external were never intended to fix the things that are internal. You see, I do believe that God cares about the things you care about. So if you care about your hair, God cares about it. If you care about your clothes, he cares about it. But at the end of the day, what matters most to God is your soul. It's who you really are. Now, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to look at the environments we keep our souls in, because I believe that a healthy environment will foster a healthy soul, and I want to look at four elements of a healthy soul. Now, here's what the four elements are. The first one starts in Genesis chapter 2. If you remember, we started in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, a couple weeks ago, with when God breathed his soul into the life of a human being. Well, by Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, he places them in a beautiful garden called the Garden of Eden. Now, chances are, if you didn't grow up in church, you've still heard about this place, the Garden of Eden, because it's famous. It's synonymous with the Bible's teaching of the beginning of the earth, and God places humanity in this garden, the Garden of Eden. And what do you think about when you think about the Garden of Eden? Well, what is the picture that comes to your mind? My, My guess is that it's not what we're going to read. This is the first mention of the garden in which God places Adam and Eve. It says this, Genesis 2, verse 9. It says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now, the next part of the verse goes on to say this. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, go back one, if you would, for me. In the garden, he placed all different kinds of trees, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now, here's one of the things I just love about God. God could have put them anywhere, but he places them in this beautiful place, and it says that the trees were pleasing to the eye and that they were good, like God wanted Adam and Eve to enjoy the place that he had actually put them in. It was beautiful to look at, and all the food tasted good. Now, to me, this says a lot about the nature and character of God, is that God is a good God who wants good things for his children, which is why he puts them in a good place to begin with. But what I love about this is these things, things that are pleasing to the eye and good food, these are the kind of words that we associate with enjoyment, with recreation, and I want to submit to you the first element of a healthy soul is the word rest. He puts them in this place where they're able to actually rest. I want to ask you this question, and this is a hard one, okay? Would you say that your life is characterized by rest? Would you say that your life is characterized from a place of rest? You see, we're better when we lead from a place of rest. We're better when we encourage others from a place of rest. You're just better when you're rested. You just are, and a healthy soul is a rested soul. Now, I want to submit this to you. Unfortunately, 
I think Christians around the globe, not you because you're awesome, but other Christians around the globe, unfortunately have this kind of a Debbie Downer vibe about them. Have, have you noticed this or is it just me? It's like we're the first to kind of like, oh, we're the first to complain about things. We're the first to, oh, so woe is me. And it's like, that's got to stop. You see, followers of Jesus who have a healthy soul are people who learn to take in the beauty of everything that God's created and then to find rest in the middle of all of it. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means this. In the Old Testament, if we were to go all the way back in the book um, of Exodus, God has these people, the people of Israel, that he calls his chosen people. And at one point, he gives them what's called the Ten Commandments. And one of them is, you shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is one day where God instructed the people of Israel, you are to stop everything. You are literally to do nothing at all except for to rest and reflect on God's goodness. You are to rest and you are to reflect on God's goodness. Now the reality is most of us at times we struggle to rest because we're so busy. We struggle to rest because we have kids and they have programs and they've got soccer and they've got school. Like we've got all kinds of things that compete for our time and compete for our attention. And God says this, I, I want you to live from a place of rest. I want you to live from a place of enjoyment where you take everything in and you realize that all of it screams of the goodness and character and nature of God. Well, what does that look like for all of us? Well, here, here's what it looks like. When was the last time you, you took a day when you just did nothing? When was the last time you took a day when you took a walk through nature and you just stopped, put your cell phone away and you just stopped and looked at the beauty of all of God's creation? When was the last time you did that? See, we get so consumed by the busyness of life and all of our phones and computers and iPads that we just, we miss all of this. And I think there is something to be said for a soul that is at rest. In fact, Jesus cared so much about it that in the book of Matthew, he, he says this. He says this in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And I just, I believe that maybe those two words define some of us today. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will do what? I will give you rest. And then he uses a, an illustration that people there would have understood. He says, take my yoke upon you. And a yoke was that wooden device that was put over two oxen to give them strength as they plowed together. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for what? Your souls. Like God's intention, Jesus' words here, they were that we would find rest in our souls. Well, how do you find rest? Let me submit this to you. I think maybe the most spiritual thing you could do today would be to not go home and try to learn the whole book of Philippians, though there's nothing wrong with that. That would be good. But I think maybe the most spiritual thing you could do today would be to take a nap. It, it would be tonight to go out and have dinner with some friends and, and enjoy the food and enjoy the time and spend time talking about the goodness of God. Do this together and watch what it does to your soul. It's the reason sometimes when we gather with friends and we laugh until like our faces hurt, it's like we leave and we say, I got to do this more. It, it, it helped. It refreshed me. It's like, because why? Because there is something good about rest and enjoyment that God intended for us that is healthy for your souls. Now, last thought. The reality for me anyways is that sometimes the reason I don't stop to rest is because I buy into the lie that I'm actually in control. You say, what do you mean? I, I just think that if I work harder, I can achieve more. I, I just think that if I do more for God, that he'll be happier with me in some way. I, I just kind of feel like that I'm the one holding the whole world together. But when I rest, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me that God is first. When I rest, it reminds me that God is the one who spins the world and keeps it in motion. When I rest, I'm reminded that I'm no longer the captain of my own ship. I am not the, I'm not the chief in command in my own life that God is. So when you rest, you remind yourself and you remind your soul that you are not first, but God is first. A healthy soul is, number one, a soul that rests. Number two, a healthy soul is a soul that begins to understand something else. Genesis chapter 2, skip down to verse 15, says this. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do two things, to work it and take care of it to work it and to take care of it. Now, I love this about God. God puts them in this garden to do two things, to work and, and to take care of it. Now, if I were to ask you, what would be the dream job? What would be the number one thing you'd want to do with your life? I know some of you would say things like this. I would just love to be independently wealthy, and I would love to travel the world and see all the sights and eat all the food. I would love to do all of those things. And that sounds wonderful and even romantic in some ways, but the reality is while it would be fun for a season, it's not good for your soul. You see, God created Adam to have rest, number one, but number two is to have responsibility. You see, responsibility, having a job, it's actually good for you. Responsibility, having something you're responsible for, it actually matters. And may maybe you're like so many people in America who just say phrases like, I'm living for the weekend, can't wait till Friday, TGIF, thank goodness it's Friday. Or like my son Gavin yesterday said to me, you know what, Dad, I hate Sundays. It's like, 
because of church? He goes, no, I love church. He goes, I hate Sundays because Sunday is the last day before I have to go back to school. Like, that's just the mentality that all of us have. But I want to submit to you, responsibility is actually good for your soul. And when you shift your focus on it, it changes everything. In fact, I think Monday can be the best day of the week. I think we can get excited about going to work. And maybe, maybe you're like so many people and you say, well, I, if you knew my boss, if you knew the person I work for, you wouldn't think that way. Well, can I show you something? The book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, says this. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. And maybe that's enough for you, but maybe it's not. Maybe you're like me and you're like, fine, I'll work hard, but maybe there's more. In the book of Colossians, Paul takes the same idea and he expounds upon it. He says, whatever you do, work it with all of your heart. Why? As working for the Lord. It's because you're not working for your boss, even though you answer to him, even though he may sign your paycheck. At the end of the day, your work, your work ethic might be your greatest testimony. You're not working for the paycheck, and you're not working for the weekend. You're working for the Lord. There is something about responsibility that matters. Now, let me offer you one other thought. One of the most important things I think you can do and take responsibility for isn't just your J-O-B, it's not just your job, but it's also the way you serve other people. You say, what does that mean? Well, I believe that in the uniquely woven into the tapestry of who all of us are, God wove gifts and talents and abilities. And he wants you to use those to serve other people. He wants you to use those maybe to earn an income, but also like to, to be a blessing. Do something with your life that matters for all of eternity. It's the reason that serving is such a big deal at our church. It, every Sunday, it takes hundreds of people. Every month, hundreds of people serve between our Lakeland campus and our Brandon campus. Hundreds of people serve. Why? Because they understand that what they do isn't just a job. It's more. It's like when we set up and tear down. When we lead a group, when we greet people in the parking lot that have maybe had a rough week. When we extend a handshake or a hug. When we love and serve people's children. When we do these things, we're working unto the Lord and we're doing something that's going to have an impact in all of eternity. So here's my question for you. Number one, are you resting well? But number two, are you serving well? See, there is this temptation in my heart at times. I want to just like hug people and say, thank you so much. I'd love to give people a check and be like, you've served so well today. But here's what I learned a long time ago. We think of serving as good for the people we're serving, and it's good. But really, who does serving bless? Blesses the servant. And so at the end of the day, you and I were created to rest well and to serve well. The third level is the next verse, Genesis 2, verses 16, I believe, and it says this. It says, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any look at this word, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Now, this is maybe the most, the most popular part of the story of creation. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now, this is the language that he uses, and this is what people think of when they think of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, why is this? Now, if you've ever taken a college-level philosophy class or religion class in a non-Christian environment, you've possibly heard this taught and said, well, if God was a good God, then why would he put a tree that is bad? Why would he create an opportunity to sin? If God was going to curse the earth because of sin, why would he enable people to sin by even placing the tree there to begin with? Now, I want you to pay attention to something. Before God gives them restrictions, he blesses them with permission. Before God gives restrictions, he gives them permission. Remember the first verse we just read? It says, God says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Any tree. How many were there? Hundreds? I don't know. Thousands of trees? You can eat from any of the trees. And the first verse we read earlier said that the fruit was good. The food was good. You can eat any of it that you want from any tree except for one. Let me kind of tease it out. It's like God's like this. Hey, Adam, look at all these trees. Ready? Yes, 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 no. Why? God, why don't you love me? Why? Why? I submit to you that the fact that God did this reveals two things. Number one is it reveals the character and nature of God. That God says yes to everything and no to one thing. It reveals his character and his grace. But the second thing is this. We would never experience love the way God intended for us to experience love if we never had a choice. And so for Adam, every day he passed by this tree and he had to say to himself, no, I know. And so the the third word is rest, that we have rest. And the second thing is we have responsibility. The third is we have restriction. And it, it is good for our souls to have a no. It is good for our souls to have a no. We can't, we can't do this. It's good for us. You say, what does that mean? Well, I really do believe that there are times that God speaks in no's. Sometimes it's something as simple 
as having dessert. And just, it's not, it's not right. It's not right for you, not for right now. Maybe for you, it's that alcohol that you're drinking. It's just, it's just, it's just a no. It's just a matter of personal conviction. Maybe for you, it is a job opportunity. Maybe for you, it's a next step in your career. I don't know what it is, but God speaks to us at times in yeses, and there's sometimes when his still small voice speaks to us in no's. No's are good for your soul. The reason is we thrive when we have boundaries. You say, what does that mean? Well, psychologists did a test some years ago where they took kids from a school and they took the fence off of their playground. And when they took the fence off of the playground, the kids all, they didn't even know it, just subconsciously, they huddled together and just played together in a small group to protect each other. The next day, they came back and put the fence back and the kids went wild all over the playground. They never noticed why, but the boundaries are what created the freedom. I could spend a lot of time here, but boundaries create freedom. You and I need a no sometimes. Sometimes you could call it a necessary no, but sometimes telling yourself no is good for your soul. Of late, I've had more opportunities than I can say yes to. So I've had to learn that there are times when I can settle for the immediate and just say yes, 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 but sometimes a no is good for my soul because it prioritizes the ultimate over the immediate. So we have rest, responsibility, restriction, and here, here's the fourth one, and maybe my favorite, maybe the most important one, it goes on to say this. To this point, God has only said it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But this is what he says, Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said it is what? It is not good. First time he says it's not good. It is not good for the man to be alone, so I will make a suitable helper for him. So when God looked down, Adam had a lot of great pets, but he didn't have a best friend. He had a lot of things that he could do with his time, but he didn't have a person to share it with. He, he had a lot of animals that he could speak to and kind of tell about his day, but he didn't have a friend to share his soul with. And so if you know the rest of the story, God creates from Adam this woman that he named Eve because he understood something important, that all of us need someone else in our life to share our soul with. Now, this doesn't talk exclusively about marriage. I think your marriage is maybe, outside of your relationship with God, the most important relationship you have. But beyond that, all of us need some friends. Uh, all of us need some people in our life that we love, that love us. People that know us and still love us in spite of knowing everything about us. And my opinion is, we should cast our social net as wide as we possibly can. Know as many people as you possibly can. Fill up your Facebook friend count to 5,000 and max it out. You should do that. That's wonderful, right? But at the end of the day, you and I need some friends that are close, that know us and love us. Friends that know everything about us and still choose to love us. Why? Because it's good for your soul. This is the reason that our access groups are such a big deal. It's because you can't be fully loved until you're fully known. And I'm not saying you should be that person that gets on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and kind of tells all of your deep, dirt, dark, dirty secrets to. I'm not saying that. But I am saying there are some people in your life that you need to take the mask off with. That there are some people in your life that you need to stop pretending that everything's okay when it's not okay. Maybe you're here and you just, you're, if you're honest, you're lonely. You have no one in your life. I am begging you. In fact, I'm begging everyone. This semester in September when our access groups start, I'm asking some of you to lead one because you can create an environment in your house or your apartment for people to come and connect relationally. And I'm asking all of you, get in a group, invest your life in someone and watch what happens. Why? It's not because we wanted one more thing to fill up your time. We want what is good for your soul. So the four elements of a healthy soul are rest, responsibility, restriction. And number four is relationship. All of us need good, solid relationships. Now let me end with this thought. All of these ideas, all four of these things are good. You should rest, you should have restrictions, you should have relationships, you should have responsibility. All four of those things are good, but all of them fall flat on their face if they're not in the context of a relationship with the one who gave you your soul to begin with. Maybe you're here and you're like so many people and you've worked so hard on the external circumstances of your life. You've worked so hard trying to fix your appearance, fix your weight, fix your relationships. You, you've even tried resting at times. You've tried to whatever medicine it takes to try to make you feel better in some way. But the reality is you'll never have a soul that's at rest and a soul that is at peace until it is connected to the one who gave you the breath, the soul in the first place. So here's how we're going to end. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to examine your soul and ask the question, am I resting well? Am I doing the responsibility thing right? A a am I saying no? Do I have some no's in my life? And finally, do I have the right kind of relationships? I'm going to ask you to examine those, but before we even go there, I'm going to ask you to ask the one question, am I right with God? You see, you'll never have a soul that's at rest until you have a soul that's connected to the one who gave you the breath, which is your soul in the first place. So here's how we're going to end today. I'm going to ask you all across this room, right here and right now to bow your head and to close your eyes. Because for just this moment, no one's looking around and no one's talking. See, this moment 
was created for you and it was created for God. Before we go any farther, before we pray over your soul, before we pray and bless you and dismiss you in a moment, I want to ask you this one question. Is it possible today that you are here and your soul is disconnected from its source? Is it possible that you're here and you would say, Jason, I'm just not right with God, the one who gave me the soul in the first place? All of those other four elements, rest, responsibility, restriction, relationships, they'll all fall flat on their face outside of a relationship with the one who gave you your soul. So if you're here and you know you're not right with God, maybe for you that means you've never made the decision to surrender your life to Jesus, or maybe you're here and you played the church game a long time ago and you just ran away from your relationship with him. If you want to make things right with God right here and right now, this is your moment. I'm going to ask you all across this room to examine your heart, and if you would say, I'm not right with God and I want to fix it right now, would you just say, would you raise your hand right now and let me know to include you when I pray? Thank you. Wow, thanks. Several of you. Here's your moment. Here's your moment. Thank you. Several of you have responded. Here's your moment. As we pray here in this moment, I'm going to ask you with your own heart and your own words to examine your soul. And as we pray, I'm going to ask you to repeat these words. But listen, praying a prayer is meaningless unless you mean it with your heart. And as we pray this prayer, we're just going to commit our lives to Jesus follow him, to receive his forgiveness. I'm going to ask you to mean it with your heart. Would you just, with your own words and your own heart, say, Jesus, today I make this decision. I surrender my life to you. And from this day forward, I make the decision to live for you. Jesus, you came into this world for one reason. I believe you came to die on a cross to pay the price for my sins. I confess that I've sinned. I confess that I need your forgiveness. So now I receive your gift of forgiveness. I receive your gift of salvation. And from this day forward, I live for you. Jesus, I love you, and I surrender all of me to you now. And it's in your name I pray.